Hey gang, Masada Yub here for the Wilson Combat Channel, to which we hope you'll subscribe. And I have with me some old friends and icons in the world of the firearm. One of those iconic old friends is the Colt Python 357 Magnum, and the other is Bill Wilson. One of my small pleasures in life is introducing friends to one another that I think will benefit from knowing each other. Can't do that here because these old friends have known each other probably longer than I've known either one. They call Bill Wilson Mr. 1911. You need to know his history with the Colt Python. Bill, could you fill us in on that? Yeah. Welcome back to the ranch, Facade. Thank you, brother. As you well know, I've always been a fan of the Colt Python. And before I ever even owned a, a 1911-45s, I'd fired hundreds of thousands of rounds through Colt Python revolvers. And, you know, one of the, one of the questions I know uh, people on the internet you know ask that they see me in shooting videos you know they're, they 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 off, often ask how come you get your finger completely out of the trigger guard you know when you when you shoot the you know a 1911 you know well i grew up shooting a colt python and as you know these things have a very sluggish trigger return and so if you don't get your finger off the trigger completely it doesn't reset to fire the next shot and so that's the reason right there is hundreds of thousands of rounds of shooting this gun fast, double action, before I ever even owned a semi-auto handgun is the reason that I, you know, do the dramatic off the trigger deal. So, got that out of the way now. Uh, the Colt Python is, in my mind, the finest shooter revolver ever produced. The finest revolver, obviously, is the Colt Shooting Master. You know, that, that that was Colt's peak there. They, every, every one of those guns were, abs were hand-built, hand-fitted, and everything. But it was a big, heavy gun. The first really shootable, you know, using gun was the Colt Python, you know. And, and, and they just, Colt did a fantastic job on this gun. I mean, it's got a 1 in 14 uh, twist rate on the barrel. They kept the boards real tight so the, so the guns shoot really, really well. You can get pretty good action on them. The, the single actions on them come out of the box typically, I mean, two and a half pounds or so. I mean, perfectly crisp. I mean, you can't complain about the single action on any of the pythons. And with a little bit of work, you can get a pretty decent double action on them. You know, this is one of them I did the action on myself. Plus it's been shot so much that it's pretty much wore in, you know, nice, nice and smooth. And then, you know, the holy grail of the action on these things is their old, you know, our old friend Jerry Moran. And so this is a Moran gun. Try the double action pull on that one. When you try one of these, you don't believe it's a, it's a Colt Python. And you don't believe it'll actually make the gun go bang every time, but, it's, it, but it's, it actually will. It's so smooth and light, it almost feels like somebody has removed the, the mainspring. And you don't get the two-stage pull at the standard Colt. It's a straight through, even. Yeah, no, no stacking whatso whatsoever. I mean, that's the nice thing about it is the actions are unbelievable on a Moran Python. The downside is, is what do you think? Maybe he did 50 action jobs total or something like that? He, he, well, I hope he's done more. <laughs> uh, I have two of his guns and a, uh, a Reeves Junkin gun, which is right in the same category. Fred Sadowski and before he stopped doing them because of arthritis in his hand, Grant Cunningham, were right up there with Jerry for the quality of, uh, of the action. The, what they were able to do was take advantage of the fact that on the Colt, compared to the Smith & Wesson or the Ruger, it's a longer pull with more mechanical advantage, and that allows a, a good pistol smith to get you a lighter pull than you can get with 100% ignition with virtually any other brand. Yeah. Anyway, what we've got here is kind of an overview of, of some pretty unique guns. Uh, this one here, this is my old shooter. I mean, this, this, I, I shot my first dipstick match with this revolver right here. Shot my first uh, bow and pin match with this revolver. Uh, this gun has been shot literally to death. It's been retimed, I think, three, three different times. And it's got the very first ever metalloid finish on it. Remember, remember metalloid yes. from, originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma. Yeah. Kind of a unique story on this gun here. I was up there uh, next next door to Metalloy, 
uh, there was a company up there that was one of our suppliers. Mm -hmm. And I'm up there visiting them at the end of the day. And, you know, we're sitting around having, having a couple of adult beverages. And Tim Turney at Metalloy comes over and starts visiting with us. Well, next thing you know, several beers down and it's 11 o'clock. And old Tim says, I've never played it a gun before. And so the next thing you know, I've yanked this thing apart and we, we played this thing at 11 or 12 o'clock at night. First, first gun Metalloy ever, ever played it. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's kind of a little bit of a, a unique side story. So that that was my original shooter, and then this is another one of my guns that that is one of my shooters that that I like. You know, it's it's a a, a newer, less less worn version. And then the, when I want to shoot a four inch, this is my this is my four inch shooter here, and it's it's not got too bad of action. You know, you, that's one of them that I just played with a little bit. Uh, it's it's very shootable. Nice. Yeah. Still got a little bit of the two stage to it. Though. Yeah, it's still got the, yeah. the two stage feel. The Cole Custom Shop actions were like that, very smooth, but still the the trigger cocking thing. You you bring it back and then finishing the yeah, essentially you're cocking it with the trigger instead of with the hammer. Yeah. Uh, bullseye shooters like that, but speed shooters didn't. Yeah. And then something you mentioned before we started the video here is you know the. Uh, People say, well, Colt pythons get out, of, get out of time real fast. And that is true if you don't have a trigger stop in one. Like you take this gun here and you shoot it a lot real fast. What's gonna happen every time that trigger comes all the way to the rear, it's still trying to turn the cylinder. It's putting everything in a bind. It's, it's putting the stop at the bottom of the bind. It's putting the hand in a bind. And, and over time, that, that overturning of the cylinder, it will it'll eventually get the gun out of time. But it's a real easy fix. All you got to do is put a trigger stop in the gun to where, you know, when, when the gun fires in, it stops on that stop. The cylinder's still got a little bit of play to it. It's not putting any extra tension on the bolt stop or the hand, and they'll stay in time just as long as a Ruger or Smith & Wesson or any other revolver, because then all you're looking at is just wear surfaces, you know, from friction. And it take a long time to wear that out. Yeah, we, we could almost call this video Colt Python Hacks. Uh, one of the complaints we hear from people who don't like the Colt is they tell you it's slower to reload because to pull the cylinder latch back instead of pushing forward like on a Smith & Wesson or pushing in on the Ruger, you have to change your hand position. Actually, you don't. Take, take a look at my hand here. And the, what slows people down is they turn their hands so they can use the tip of their thumb. You want to use this surface of your thumb right here. And as the right-handed shooter comes up, it just catches, and there's an effortless release there. Slap those guys out, throw the six new guys in, and you're back to work. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard to find any legitimate complaints about the, about the Colt Python. The accuracy thing is true. As Bill said, the, the tighter uh, chambers, the tighter bore, and what you have with the Colt is what they used to call bank vault lockup. When the hammer drops on most revolvers, you've still got a little bit of play here. Now remember, you want that chamber as solidly locked behind the barrel as you can. But watch with the Colt. As the hammer falls, that cylinder is dead nuts locked. Absolutely no motion. Now you take that, you take Colt's 1 and 14 inch rifling twist which is more amenable to the 148 grain wad cutter and most 158 grain bullet loads. And you tend to get better accuracy than the one and 18 and three quarter inch twist that you find in the Smith and Wesson and the Ruger. Uh, that's why when they rebarreled uh, PPC guns uh, for you know, police combat competition, and they'd put on a heavy Douglas barrel, it damn sure wasn't gonna be one and 18 and three quarter inch twist. Uh, that one inch diameter stovepipe six inch barrel was going to be either one in 14 or occasionally for wad cutters one in 10 inch. And so what else we got here, you know, it's kind of talked about, you know, my shooter guns here. Got some pretty rare ones out here. Uh, we've got the, this is what's called the Snake Eyes set. And these are pretty hard to come by. It's a, it's a you know, two gun set, you know, with a two and a half inch barrel, you know, comes, you know, both in stainless and in, and in blue. And this big old boy here, uh, you know, you think, well, what's that? That's just another eight inch python. Well, this particular one here is Colt's ill-fated thing they thought was a good idea back in the 70s. They chambered some of these in 38 special. 
you got this big, humongous, heavy gun capable of 357 Magnum, and they chambered them in, th in 38 Special. Well, back then, you couldn't give one of these guns away. I mean, there was no demand for them. So obviously, Colt didn't make them very long. Well, now, you know, all these years later, extremely rare gun. Very hard, very hard to, to find new in the box, you know, like that one is. Uh, and it, it turned out to be a very valuable gun just because there's so few of them out there. And from there we go to, this is a pretty rare little bird right here. This is, this is the three inch. And Colt didn't make a lot of three inch guns. This, this, is a, this is a pretty hard gun to find, especially in a pristine condition like that. But we can go one step further. This is what's called the California Special. And that's the th very limited, uh, show the deal here. They claim 200 of those were made. And- uh, it Says right on there. Yeah. Special logo on the barrel. Yeah, so that's, that's an extremely, extremely rare gun right there. Now, Bill, so far we've been talking about the old classic pythons, the, the truly iconic ones. In 2020, Colt brought the Python back uh, with modern manufacturing and changes that made it reasonably affordable with a approximately $1,500 list. What's your take on the new ones? I had one of them for a while. Uh, the gun shot pretty well. The single action pull was nothing like the old guns. It was probably four and a half pounds. It, it, it was crisp, but it was, but it was a heavy. The double action pull, though, I think was on average slightly better than some of the early guns. But, you know, that gun has got one major flea. I mean, the sights. What, why they took that nice gun that, and then put such a cheap piece of crap rear sight on it that won't, that won't hold zero makes no sense to me. And then to make, to make things worse, they changed the cut in the top strap so you can't put one of the old sights on it to fix the problem. You know? I mean, it's like, who was, who thought that was a good idea? Now, folks, the old pythons came standard with what they called an acro sight, which was, you know, pr pretty decent. Mm -hmm. But what most of us did is shot them seriously. We put on the Eliasson, uh, much more positive and uh, much more precise adjustment. Ken Sight now, K-E-N-S-I-G-H-T, is the heir to the, uh, the Elias and Sight concept. From what I hear, they're getting enough requests for Elias and Sights that will fit the new 2020 Pythons that hopefully they will eventually have one. So keep an eye on the Ken Sight folks. And if you have a 2020 Python, that's going to fix the one weak link in an otherwise wonderful system. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, the gun is a no-go with that rear sight on it. I mean, you, ba right. you basically have to zero the gun and squirt the rear sight full of Loctite, you know, to, so it won't move. And you got a fixed sight, fixed sight revolver now. Yeah. Uh, my, my collection doesn't approach yours. Uh, I've got five and a half, one of each barrel length. And the three inch, because I could not afford the rarity of one of these, is one of the new 2020s. It's the same $1,500 list as the other Pythons and the new ones. Uh, my half Python is a Smython, a uh, Bill Davis custom with a Python barrel and a K-frame Smith & Wesson. But they, they perform. Uh, Colt advertised it in the mid-1950s as the Cadillac of revolvers. Many gun writers called it the Rolls Royce because of all the hand work that went into it. Uh, Mid-1970s, I visited Colt and talked to the people who created it. Uh, Adelbert Gunther, Al Gunther, who had built, literally built the first prototype. Um, was still alive and told us the story of how it was developed originally as a super 38 caliber target revolver, kind of a highly refined version of their officer's model Natch, which really dominated center fire revolver competition at the time. And the Magnum chambering was almost an afterthought. I uh, spoke with Aldi John, who had been head of production and really finalized the production on them. And when you look at these guns, that royal blue finish, is a function more than anything else of the polish. Uh, ma only master polishers were allowed to touch these guns. It went all the way up to 400 grit polishing compound, which is like flour or something. Mm -hmm. And basically it was their version of Smith & Wesson's Model 27, the, the flagship of the fleet that showed here is just how fine a gun we can make, how fancy a gun we can make, how precise a gun we can make. 
But I think what Bill and I both found as, as serious shooters with them, they performed. It wasn't just the looks, it wasn't just the craftsmanship, it was the performance. So uh, they can call it Cadillac, they can call it Rolls Royce, I would call it Porsche because these things won a lot of races for both Bill and I back when we were shooting them. And if you get involved with one seriously, you'll see that performance level too. And they can be really, really pretty if you uh, get the, this is a early gun here with the top of the line engraving from, from Colt, you know, their master factory engraving. And I think they call this the D level engraving, if not, if I'm not mistaken, but that, that four and six inch pair there, they've, it's, they both got the, the top of the line engraving on them. So they can not only be functional, but can be virtually a, a work of art for cosmetics. So that's kind of the overview folks of, of the Colt Python that, that uh, both Mossad and I have, have both been big fans of for years. And uh, you know what, even, even our old buddy Hackathorn is kind of coming around. Uh, you know, he's uh, always been uh, the Smith and Wesson guy, you know, and, and he's even come around a little bit. Yeah, they're not so bad, you know. Uh, there's Ford and Chevy, there's Coke and Pepsi, and in handguns in our time, it was Colt and Smith and Wesson. But it's a little bit of history, and each one of them also is a little piece of iconic American craftsmanship. Yeah. Thanks for joining us and allowing Bill to share this wonderful collection. We do hope you'll subscribe to the Wilson Combat Channel, and we'll look forward to seeing you down the road.